Okay, let's get started. This is our second meeting uh, for the seminar course. Uh, and you had some homeworks to do. And we had the homework to process your homeworks. And that's what happened essentially. So this is what happened. Basically only 27 uh, registered students, which is still more than the slots we have, but we can accommodate 27. Uh, submitted the, basically fulfilled the talk slot assignment requirements. So the requirements were submit homework zero and explicitly provide paper references. 27 people did that. Actually, I think 28 people did that and then one person dropped the course for whatever reason. <laughs> so now it's 27. So hopefully you're one of those 27 over <laughs> in here and we'll take attendance. But if you've done both of these, then that's good. Basically, we have assigned papers based on your preferences, if you're one of those 27 people. And everybody gets their top choice. If you have multiple top choices, that's good, because that enabled us to flexibility. But everybody got whatever their, and the top choice was either five or four. Some people were stingy, they didn't want to give a five to any paper. <laughs> yes? It didn't work for me five. When I picked five, it switched back to four. Okay, I see. I don't know, that's a bug in the Moodle. Maybe, okay. So it could be because, yeah, there are multiple reasons, of course, right? It could be because people are stingy or there could be a reliability problem in the system. Reliability problems always, yeah, maybe somebody put in some ordering and they got the paper that they didn't like, but you can tell us if that's the case. But hopefully not. Uh, basically, we've done this assignment uh, and everyone got their top choices. And we've assigned mentors based on the paper topic also. I think that's important. Uh, we're gonna iterate on this a little bit. Uh, and we will provide these assignments later this week. But the good news is I think all of this is done. Hopefully those 27 people are not gonna change their minds and drop the course. Uh, I hope not. Uh, if, you're, if you want to do that, please do it as soon as possible, like right now, and let us know as soon as possible, because that will change the schedule. So with 27 people, I think we can manage. And uh, of course with 22, I think it would have been better, uh, but I think we can manage 27. Uh, so if you're going to drop, there are five people who are going to drop, please drop <laughs> right away. <laughs> that way we can have a more, more relaxed schedule. Okay, so basically what we, this is the logistics. We're going to have nine sessions of presentations from you uh, and one extra wrap-up session at the end. This means that uh, there are three presentations in each of the nine sessions. So it's going to be a very tight schedule, uh, but I want everyone to present uh, like one by one. That's, I think, good experience for everyone. Uh, but it still gives us not a terrible amount of time. Basically, you get maximum 35 minutes total for each presentation plus discussion, which is, I think, not bad. Uh, the unfortunate thing is we'll have to take the entire two hours in each meeting. No break, so bring your food. Uh, <laughs> that's the downside to accommodate everyone. I don't, you can, of course, go out if you want. Please do that without disrupting the class. But that's the only way we can run it with 27 students. Uh, there's no other fair way, actually. If we actually divide it to two students per paper, then we won't have enough slots, actually. Uh, yeah. And I think it's more fair to you if you actually do and have the fun yourself presenting. So that's the understanding. Hopefully you're, you're fine with that. But feel free to, this, of course, you can go out, especially at the end of a presentation and beginning of some, uh, of some other one, you can go out and take a break and come back. Just make sure it's not your presentation when you're doing that. <laughs> okay, uh, so each presentation, uh, one student presents one paper and leads the discussion. I'm gonna give you more examples today actually, just to set the stage a little bit. Hopefully that'll be fun. Uh, maximum tw 25 minutes summary and analysis and maximum 10 minute discussion plus brainstorming plus feedback. That's the idea. Of course, if you can do a good summary in 20 minutes, that's better. Uh, Basically, we're going to run, run a very tight ship. <laughs> right, is everybody okay with that? I mean, it's not fun in the end. It's be I'd much rather have two presentations where each is allocated 45 minutes and you have a break in between, but we don't have that option at this moment. So hopefully everybody's okay. And I, I hope you promise that you, you don't drop it because this won't run as well if you drop it. <laughs> Okay, uh, and it should follow the suggested guidelines. I'll give you more examples of those guidelines today. But I think it'll be fun in the end, this course. Uh, uh, as, as you can see, there are no exams or nothing. It's a seminar course, but let's try to make it fun and uh, learn from it. So algorithm for presentation preparation. I like formulating things as algorithms. I don't know if this is an algorithm, but uh, let's see. 
I think study lecture one again for presentation guidelines. Read and analyze your paper thoroughly. Uh, discuss with anyone you wish. Use any resources. Everything is fair game, basically. You, if you use a resource, copy something and put it into your slide, make sure that you reference that thing. I think that's really important. Uh, prepare a draft presentation based on the guidelines. Uh, and meet mentors and get feedback. That's the first meeting. Revise the presentation and delivery. And meet the mentors again and get further feedback. And that's revise the presentation and delivery. So these are the two required meetings. Don't skip them. That's going to be important. You have to schedule, them with your, uh, you have to schedule the meetings with your assigned mentors. And we may suggest meeting times to prune the search space uh, of that meeting. Is that good? Any questions so far? This is what we discussed in the past. So uh, basically, I think this is what I would recommend also practicing as much as possible. Uh, OK, I'll do example paper presentations, but I would like to go over this uh, a little bit again. So this worked out actually uh, well in the sense that uh, if we had 22 uh, people and uh, two papers per session, we would have started next week. Now we're not going to start your presentations next week, which is good. Actually, we're not going to start. When are we starting? On the 17th, right? Yes. yes. So we're going to start on the 17th of October. So this is actually more fair for people who are going to go early. They will have enough time for preparation. So I hope it helps, as opposed to some people scrambling starting next week, right? It's much better to have, I guess, you, you'll have complete, uh, I guess, three weeks, more than three weeks to prepare for the first talks. That's good. OK, recording, we should, that's something we should discuss. Uh, do, are people OK with being recorded? Well, are we put up on the internet, or is it for internal use? Internal use, yes. Okay. So unless you want to be put up on the internet, <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK, it's, more, it's going to be mainly for internal use. <laughs> Up to you. Uh, so I think if, you, if you're OK, you'll need to sign something, basically. That's uh, to be recorded. And we'll make you sign. So maybe we'll send an email asking uh, who's OK and who is willing to sign it and who's not OK. Is that good? So I think this could be, OK, what are the benefits of being recorded? It's not going to go on uh, the website like my lectures. Uh, that's a different thing. This is basically the benefits of being recorded is you can actually take it and use it for your own purpose. You're, you're welcome to have that video and you can actually see what you've done. I, I find it actually this is very useful uh, to study uh, my own presentation and then go back and say, look, I could have done this better, maybe. I think that's right. There's an instructive purpose. That's the main purpose, actually. There's no other purpose over here. We don't need to record things. So, OK, we'll send out, uh, I guess, uh, your input. And please respond, yes or no, or yes or no with some, uh, maybe a third box over there. Maybe yes or no is not black and white. There's a gray area that I cannot anticipate right now. That's the patchability in the field, right? Uh, you have to have some patchability. OK, uh, OK, anything else related to logistics? Does everything sound good? Sound good? No questions? OK, if there are no questions, then what I will do is give you a bit more examples. Because I think it's always good to see examples. Uh, and if you don't want the examples, uh, that's fine. But you can leave if you want. That's fine. But then you will, you will need to sign, for the, sign the attendance sheet somehow. <laughs> so I think learning by example is really important. It's a great way of learning. We already did one example last time, memory channel partitioning. We will do at least one more today. Let's see how it goes. And just to remind you, this is the structure of the presentation, right? Uh, basically. Actually, I will do this. You first, uh, it's good to have the slide template and then maybe fill in the slide template. That helps. Uh, of course, you can customize it to your uh, taste. Maybe you don't like the screen color over there, right, or whatever. Uh, so background, problem, and goal. Providing that is really important in a paper. Actually, writing papers are exactly the same way. Whenever you write a paper, you've got to start with the back problem and goal, actually. Uh, but some, you may need actually some background to motivate the problem and goal also. Novelty is really important. What, are the, what is the key novelty and contributions of the paper? What is the key approach and ideas? What are the mechanisms in some detail? What are the key results? What is the methodology? How does the evaluation look like? Uh, and a summary. Basically, that's the summary. That's supposed to be 25 minutes max. Uh, I think you can do most papers in 20 minutes, uh, maybe even 15 minutes. Depends on how much detail you go into, but I'll give you an example of the level of detail. And then you discuss the strengths 
of the paper and then the weaknesses of the paper and then provide your thoughts and ideas. The, the critical part, a, a big critical part is this one, of course. Weaknesses is really important, right? That's how, that's, one of the big purposes of this class is to critically analyze the papers and you should really focus on strengths, of course, that's important, but weaknesses is a lot more important in the sense that that's what really advances the world. Uh, thoughts and ideas, I think this is also important. I'd like to get your thoughts and ideas and you will see some other examples over here and some key takeaways and open discussion after that. Basically, if you have some questions that you think, oh, this, we should discuss as a group, that's, that could open up some good things, that's always good to add it to the questions. Now, of course, we have a time limit. We're not gonna be able to do uh, this uh, post summary part from the strengths and weaknesses more than 10 minutes, but it's always good to have them. Okay. So shall we do another example paper presentation, you think? Who says yes? Okay, that's a lot of hands. Who says no? Okay, that's fine. You can express your opinion. I think that's perfectly fine to say no. But I guess there's no true no's or maybe they're sleeping. I don't see anyone sleeping. That's good. So I'll, I picked this paper. This is not one of the assigned papers because I, otherwise it would not be fair if I picked an assigned one. Uh, but yeah, I'll do this paper. This is, again, my paper. But it's good to cr be critical about your own work. Uh, and also this gives me less time to prepare, as you can see. Uh, okay, so we're gonna talk about this paper that was published in Micro in 2013. Uh, the lead author is my PhD student, Vivek Sashadri, who's now at Microsoft Research in India, doing great things. Uh, and there are a bunch of authors, as you can see. And this, is, this was in collaboration with Intel uh, over there uh, in Pittsburgh. And this is, the, the, the title is Fast and Energy Efficient India and Bulk Copy and Initialization. So I'll stick to the outline. Basically, the first background problem and goal, uh, I'm gonna use some of his slides also, actually. Uh, basically, memory channel is a bottleneck in existing systems. Uh, it has limited bandwidth and it consumes high energy. We're going to try to solve that problem. And our goal, uh, the goal of this paper is to reduce the memory bandwidth demand somehow by reducing unnecessary data movement. And one big source of unnecessary data movement in existing systems is bulk data copy and bulk data initialization. So if you're copying, let's say, four kilobyte page to another four kilobyte page, that goes through the memory channel today. If you're initializing, let's say, a huge database to all zeros to begin with, maybe one terabytes, you basically go through the memory channel and write every single zero into memory. That sounds a bit stupid, right? But yeah, that's, how, that's what we do today. Uh, and people actually have looked at uh, different issues related to these bulk data copy and initialization and shown that actually operating systems do a lot of data copy and data initialization. Whenever you fork a process, for example, you copy the data to the other process that's going to use it. Whenever you initialize data, operating systems do a lot of initialization for security. For example, Windows, Linux, they all have these zero page pools, which are pages that are zeroed out so that nobody leaks information from one process to another process, right? So security is a big application of that. And yeah, there are other uh, papers that are written saying why aren't operating systems getting as fast as hardware, uh, uh, getting faster as fast as hardware. <laughs> so everybody's getting faster, but hardware is getting faster than operating systems, according to this. Of course, I'm digressing here. You don't, don't, don't digress when you present, but uh, I think this is also a lecture a little bit. Uh, basically, there are a lot of papers that talk about uh, uh, need for hardware support for bulk copy and initialization. And this is one example, hardware support for bulk data movement that does it in the memory controller from Intel. And this is another one uh, from Intel also. So, okay, bulk data copy and initialization actually is a good primitive that's used by many things. As I said, forking, initializing pages for security purposes, checkpointing, you create one checkpoint of the data and then you may go back to it if some fault happens. Cloning of a virtual machine, deduplication, page migration, uh, migrating one page from one place to another such that somebody else can use it more efficiently and there are many, many more. And there's a recent paper, this is my add to the paper, this is not in the paper that was published in 2013, but I know other works in the field that say, uh, even these simple system calls, mem move and mem copy, consume 5% of the cycles in Google's data center. You may say, oh, 5%, who cares? But 5% is a lot actually for just two system calls to be consuming the entire data center cycles for. And this is, Google actually analyzed almost all of their data center workloads like Gmail, Search, uh, some YouTube, uh, and a bunch of other things uh, in that paper. Uh, okay, so clearly this is important. And mem, 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 mem copy are just 
two examples of system calls that do bulk copy and initialization, because you can do bulk copy and initialization without doing mem move and mem copy rate. You don't need to do that. Okay, what is the shortcoming of today's systems? Basically, if you want to copy this page to this other page, you need to bring the source page byte by byte all the way into the L1 today. You need to bring the destination page byte by byte all the way into the L1. You need to do the copy and you need to write back the destination page. I'm not showing all of the steps over here. But this is high latency because let's assume this four kilobytes, you need to move five, four kilobytes all the way over here. You need to move the four kilobytes over, all the way over here, do the writing and then write the result back. That's three round trips, uh, well, three trips basically. High bandwidth utilization because you will actually use this uh, very precious resource that has limited bandwidth. Some other applications may not, be may not utilize it or use it while this application is doing the copy. And if it's a huge copy, then it's even pro more problematic, right? If you're copying a one gigabyte page to another gigabyte page, that's even more problematic. This causes cache pollution because you could actually pollute the caches over here. You may have other data. Uh, and you may actually never use this data. You copy the page and you don't need it right away. You may need it, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes later. There's no reason to bring it into the cache if you're not going to need it right away. And this causes unwanted data moments. So there's a lot of churn that happens in the system. So in today's systems, you could actually eliminate that cache pollution. You could actually do a direct memory access and do this copy through the memory controller without disturbing the caches. There is an option like that with some overhead of setting up the direct memory access. But okay, if you do this copy with, via direct memory access through the memory controller for a four kilobyte page with some technology assumptions that are in the paper, it takes about 1,046 nanoseconds and it consumes 3.6 microjoules of energy. Now, the novelty of this paper is to propose a new mechanism to do this in memory without going through the processor. The idea is very simple, basically that. Use the memory to copy this page to uh, this other page. And we're going to go into the implementation, of course, in the next steps. But let's look at the high-level idea first. So what are the benefits of this? It's low latency because we're going to use, we're not going to go through this huge interconnect, first of all, and go through the memory hierarchy, but we're going to use the internal interconnect, which is much faster inside memory. Low bandwidth utilization. We're not going to use the bandwidth if we're, if we're not going to move the data out of the chip. That's good because some other processor now can use this data. Uh, no cache pollution, but you could eliminate that today anyway if you're doing this through the DMA engine. And no unwanted data moment in the end. And this paper proposed a mechanism that takes this four kilobyte page copy from 1046 nanoseconds to 90 nanoseconds and the 3.6 microjoules energy consumption to 0.04 microjoules. <coughs> so basically one to two orders of uh, magnitude reduction. Then the key question is how do they do it? Basically, uh, I'm going to go through this a little bit more detail, but I'll give you the key idea first. So if you remember from digital circuits, you have a memory that consists of subarrays and these subarrays are connected uh, to a row buffer and row buffer is the sense amplifiers. Basically, if you want to access a row, you need to activate the source row, which brings the data into the row buffer and it gets amplified and it gets stored strongly over here. So to be able to do the copy from the source row to a destination row uh, inside the DRAM, first they need to be in the same subarray. And if they are in the same subarray and if you want to the copy the source row to this destination row, what you need to do is first activate the source row, which brings the data into the row buffer. And now the data is nicely here in the row buffer. The next step is activating the destination row. Now, if you do that activation, you implicitly deactivate this, activate this. What happens is the data that you stored in the row buffer, which belonged to row A, starts driving the destination cells because these, these are actually very strong sense amplifiers. The size of each, of one, each one is more than 100 times the size of a single cell. As a result, these can drive uh, the value that they stored in the previous activate back into the array. So that's the idea. Activate the source row, bring the data into the row buffer, activate the destination row, which transfers the row into the destination. That's the simple key idea that this paper really builds on. And of course, this works if the source and destination are in the same row buffer. Uh, say, sorry, same subarray. That's the, uh, the two consecutive activates and the hardware cost is negligible and the paper talks about the fact that you cannot do it in existing hardware because it's not allowed basically. Uh, because uh, the, you don't have the, uh, the hardware doesn't know whether the source and destination row are actually in the same subarray or not. Okay, so mechanisms, let's go into a little bit more detail uh, now that I've given you the key idea. It's always good to key give the key idea of the paper. Let's look at the mechanism. So this, if you look at a DRAM chip, it looks like this. 
uh, it says um, chip I.O. This is the interconnect that we talked about between the memory and the processor, and you have banks. In existing systems, you have 16 banks, but I'm, uh, this is an example over here, and you have some internal bus. That internal bus moves the data between uh, the banks and the chip. But if you look at a bank, internally you have subarrays. Each subarray has a row buffer, as we've discussed earlier. Uh, that's the subarray, basically. You have a row of DRM cells and a row buffer. So now this clearly gives you that, okay, this mechanism is very limited, right? What I described it happens within a subarray. What if, but what if the source row and the destination row are in different banks? What if they're in different subarrays in the same bank? So the paper tackles all of those. Basically, it's a general purpose data movement mechanism from any location to any location inside a single DUM chip. Which means that your source can be, a source and destination can be in the same subarray. Uh, and you do the data movement at row granularity. This is called the fast parallel mode. Source and destination can be in different banks. And you, do, you can do the data moment at the byte granularity in this case because this, this, uh, these uh, buses over here are at the byte granularity. It's called pipeline serial mode. And then there's a weird case, which is inter subarray. Basically, you are in different subarrays, but in the same bank. But it turns out these subarrays are not connected to each other in any easy way. So you actually need to do something special over there. OK, so let's look at the fastest mechanism. Basically, fastest uh, copying happens if the source row and the destination row are in the same subarray. And this is a subarray abstraction. The source row is there. First, the idea is first you, so you move the source row to the row buffer, and then you move the row uh, that row buffer values to the destination row. That's the idea, two consecutive activates. So how do you do this? And that's the key question. Now we go one level deeper to the circuit level. This is the source row, this is the destination row, and I'm only showing only one cell. You can think of this, the row is actually extending, and you have copies of this for every single column that you have in the row. Uh, so how do you do this interest array copy? Initially, this cell is storing charged, charge state. And initially, this bit line over here is uh, the reference voltage, VDD over 2. And the sense amplifier is not turned on. So this is uh, at a stable state. They're both at the reference uh, voltage, VDD over 2. Now we're going to take advantage of the charge sharing capabilities of the circuit. That's exactly how DRM works. It's based on charge. Now if you activate the source row, what happens is this capacitor gets connected to this bit line and it shares some of its charge with the bit line. And the charge on the bit line gets perturbed just by little because this capacitor is actually very small. It has very little charge. Once you perturb that charge over there, the sense amplifier detects this. It turns on. It, once it starts, it starts amplifying the difference. And this circuit, as you can see, it's a cross-coupled inverter. It amplifies the difference and it gets into a stable state. And the stable state, in this case, is this becomes VDD and this becomes zero. Now you've sensed what was inside here. As you can see, you sense that it was VDD, which is charged. And then what happens, because these things are still connected, now the sense amplifier starts driving the charge back into the uh, cell, because it's very strong, right? It's really dry, it has very high drive power. That's how you restore the charge. So temporarily, you lose the charge in the cell, sense amplifier amplifies it, and then drives it back into the cell. Now we've sensed it, we have VDD over here. Now the idea of row clone is after, this is normal operation, normal DRAM operation. You activate it, that row. The idea is to disconnect this at this state. You keep the value over here, which was the value of this one, and connect this with another activate. That another activate does that, essentially. And once you connect this over here, let's assume it's discharged to begin with. This is all VDD, and sends some fires driving, so it drives the data into the cell, charge into the cell. And the data essentially gets copied this way. And this is an example where the source cell was one and the destination cell was zero, which means that it's charged and discharged, but it could be actually all combinations. All combinations work with the same principle. OK, that's the idea. Basically, that was the intra subarray. You activate the source row, which copies the data from source, uh, source to the row buffer, and then you activate the destination row, which disconnects the source from the row buffer, connects the destination, and copy the copies the data from the row buffer to the destination. So the big benefit, the paper evaluates this, and it shows basically significant latency reduction and significant memory energy reduction. This should be memory energy, actually. Uh, I forgot to change that. Oh. So no bandwidth consumption. No bandwidth consumption on the memory bus uh, bottleneck, and very little changes to the DRAM chip. And the paper has more detail on that. So there are clearly constraints in this case. Location of source and destination, both should be in the same subarray, right? That's a constraint. 
And you should, you should always be thinking, I, actually a paper discusses these constraints, but whenever you're reading a paper, you should think about, oh, what are the constraints of this mechanism? Is it always applicable? Uh, size of the copy, in this case, you copy all of the data from the source row to the destination. It's, it's basically, it's a row granularity copy. You cannot do it at a finer granularity. So if you want to copy one kilobytes, good luck. It doesn't happen. You have to copy four kilobytes, whatever your row size is. So there are downsides, of course. And so, of course, it doesn't work uh, across the uh, bank. So uh, the next mechanism that the paper develops is an interbank copy mechanism that's called pipeline serial mode. Basically, the idea is what if your source, uh, you have, uh, the banks have a shared internal bus, and you can use that shared internal bus to copy arbitrary amounts of data from one bank to another bank. This doesn't have to be at the row granularity because this shared internal bus happens to be 64 bits in existing chips. So the idea is pipeline serial mode. Yeah, I think that gave, gave, you, gave you the idea, right? Basically, you set this bank into the read mode. You set that bank into the write mode. And then you basically send a command saying copy n bytes from here to there. Of course, this requires a change to the interface now. You need to add this new command. Uh, and the paper discusses the implementation, but I'm not going to go into the detail. So this way, you can overlap the latency of the read and write because once while you're writing over here, you're reading from this bank, especially if you're copying a lot of data. Right? You can move an entire row. But you can also move a single byte. It's a little bit more flexible. But the downside is this is slower. You're not taking advantage of the analog chart sharing operation that I described earlier. You're taking advantage of really, well, it's uh, some digital operation over here, but some analog data movement also. But basically, it's not, it's slow. You're going further in the DRAM chip. So you get about 2x latency reduction, 1.9x, and 3.2x memory energy reduction. It's not as impressive as 11 versus 70 and, and 74, right? But it enables you to move data between different banks. Now you can copy this data that you moved internally within that subarray, right? OK, so to generalize, uh, intra-subarray copy requires two activates. Interbank copy. As I described it, pipeline internal read or write. We didn't cover one case that the paper covers, which is what if the data is the source row is in this subarray and the destination row is in the subarray. Well, it turns out that's not easy to do in existing DRAM chips because you can only activate one row per bank. You cannot activate multiple rows per bank. And there's no connection between the subarrays between a bank, uh, within a bank. So what you need to do, uh, this, this paper proposes using inter-subarray copy. Uh, well, inter, to interbank copy twice. Basically, you take the data from the subarray uh, in this bank, put it into some other bank, a temporary location, and then take it from there and put it into the destination subarray. So you use that interbank copy twice, which is not nice. And as you will see in the results, it's not very performant also. But all of this comes at 0.01% area cost, and the area cost is detailed in the paper. OK, we talked about copy a lot. What about initialization? Initialization is simpler. Actually, initialization is a special case of copy, right? If you want to initialize something, some row, uh, you, want, you, you basically uh, put the data value to some row and then copy from that row to whatever your row you want to initialize. And that's the idea over here. So one proposal in this paper is in a subarray, let's say uh, 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 you fix one row to be all zeros. And if you want to initialize any row to zero, you copy that row to the other rows in that subarray. And you get very little loss in capacity because you have many rows inside uh, uh, subarray. That's one idea. Uh, and if, if you want to uh, arbitrarily initialize with arbitrary values, basically you initialize one row with those arbitrary values. It takes time. And then you can copy the data to the other rows after that. So imagine you're initializing a billion rows this way if you have a lot of memory. Then this is not bad, right? You do it once, and then you amortize the cost of copying through a row clone. So it turns out zero initialization, most common. Uh, the idea is to reserve a row in each subarray, always zero. You copy the data from the reserved row. You get significantly lower latency and significantly lower DRAM energy. Uh, of course, the latency and energy savings are not as high as the copy because initialization is a simpler operation, right? It's, it's just one way. It's not you're bringing multiple things. And the loss in capacity is relatively low. So this is a summary of the results, basically. Lat well, summary of the uh, latency and energy results for particular operations. This is the latency reduction that you get uh, for copies. intra subarray is significant. Inter, inter bank is OK. inter subarray, as I said, is not, basically, you don't get any benefit. In terms of energy, you get benefit on all of them. 
but clearly you would like your source and destination rows to be in the same subarray if you would like to get the most of this. Actually, this should read as memory energy. It's not the entire energy. Uh, and intrasubarray, subarray basically, zeroing is always intrasubarray, subarray as you can see, and you get significant uh, performance and energy benefits. Okay. Okay, so the paper also discusses some system design issues to enable row clone. I think this is really important, and I think this is the strength of the paper, as I will discuss later. Okay, you have the substrate that can do this. How do you build applications on top of it? Well, applications need to communicate occurrences of this bulk copy and initialization across these layers, clearly. That's important. How do you do that? Which means that you need to have changes to the ISA and the operating system. Uh, and fortunately, the paper discusses that most existing ISAs have string copy instructions. For example, the x86 ISA has a repeat move s instruction. It's essentially a repeat prefix that is appended to a move instruction. That way you can actually copy arbitrary amounts of data, actually. So you can actually do that in real systems. That's good. Uh, how do you ensure cache coherence? What if you're actually copying data inside the memory and there's some other processor that's trying to access that data? How do you ensure that cache coherence? Normally, you don't think of memory doing intelligent things by itself, right? So I think that's important. It's discussed in the paper. The paper basically says you, you need to basically flush the data into the memory and ensure that no one accesses it, right? But maybe there are other solutions to it. How do you maximize the latency and energy savings? Clearly, there is a huge disparity, right? Depending on where the source row and the destination row are. Ideally, you would like to keep them in the same subarray. Whose task is it? Is it the operating system's task when they're doing the mapping? Maybe, right? Is it the application's task? So you need to be very, uh, there, there's these system level issues that the paper discusses that need to be solved. And how do you handle data reuse? So what if you actually need to reuse the data immediately after you copy it, right? There are all these issues that are discussed in the paper. Not, not all of them have solutions, novel solutions in the paper. Okay, so basically hardware, there are two new instructions, memcopy and meminit. These are similar instructions in existing ISAs. And microarchitecture checks if the instructions can be sped up using row clone with some mechanisms and it exports the instructions to the memory controller. Managing cache coherence, row clone modifies data in memory, so you need to maintain coherence. So similar to DMA, basically source and destination are in memory, you can le leverage hardware support for DMA. You can read the paper for more detail. That's not the main focus of this presentation or the paper. Maximizing the use of path parallel mode, as I said, you want the data to be in the same subarray. Most operating systems today are uh, not subarray aware, so you can make the operating system subarray aware. And you can, uh, you can have primitives uh, that are amenable to use of fast parallel mode. Copy on write, for example. Uh, whenever, so uh, operating systems do copy on write. What they do is they do, uh, they keep the same page for different processes, let's say, uh, for, for different threads. And when, thread, when one thread writes, the, writes to the page, or when, when, when one process writes to the page, they copy it. So only copy the page when you really need a, a separate copy, when you actually modify the data, right? So whenever you do that, you can allocate the destination in the same subarray as the source. Right? If the operating system actually knows the topology of DRAM and knows where the page, uh, what the DRAM looks like. Right? And then it can use FPM to copy. If FPM is fast parallel mode. So th this is a very simple optimization that can enable the operating system to be more aware of this uh, subarray. And as a result, it can speed up copy on write significantly. Box zeroing. Uh, Again, you can use fast parallel mode to copy data from the reserved zero row. And this is actually relatively easy. Okay, handling data reuse after zeroing. This paper specifically talks about the case of handling data reuse after zeroing, but there are, this is actually a more general problem. It should talk about the more general problem, but the general problem is harder to solve. Uh, so basically, you have data reuse after zero initialization. Uh, in the phase one, OS zeroes out the page. And in phase two, application uses the cache lines of the page. Right? In this case, row clone is good in phase one. It avoids misses in phase one, but incurs misses in phase two. Basically, if you do the copy inside the memory, yes, there are no, there's no problem. You don't bring the data into the processor. So OS part is fast. But now when the application needs to access it, you have a problem because copying has been done in memory and you need to bring that data. So maybe it's okay, but this paper proposed an acceleration mechanism, row clone zero insert. Basically, uh, Whenever you're zeroing, uh, if the cache line is already present, uh, or even if they're not present, there's some discussion in the paper, you insert zero cache lines for those things that you're zeroing in memory. So this can be done completely independently. You don't need to bring any data from anywhere. While you're zeroing in memory, 
you basically are, are zeroing in the cache also, those cache lines. That's the idea. It's very simple. No data movement. Both, of the, both processor and memory are zeroing the same things, and they're keeping the data coherent. Of course, it works with zero, but if you're doing some other copy, it may not work as well. Okay, so let's, do, uh, let's talk about methodology and evaluation of the application level results. So this is the methodology of the paper. It uh, develops an out-of-order multi-core simul uh, simulator. These are the parameters. It's a DDR3, so this is 2013. Today, we are at 2018, so we're at DDR4, for example. And it uses uh, six copy and initialization intensive applications and plus some spec uh, CPU workloads for multi-core. And it uses these metrics, instruction throughput for single core and weighted speed up for multi-core. And these are the applications that the authors have de developed or uh, used, system boot up, booting the OS, for example, compilation, forking, this is actually the poster child for this, memcached, inserting a large number of objects, some database loading, shell script, and you can imagine other things. Uh, and these are, this is basically the characteristics of the workloads. It's the fraction of memory traffic caused by zeroing, copying, writes and reads, and other writes and reads. Basically, it's a significant amount of traffic in some of these applications. So forking, for example, actually there's a case study in the paper that, talk, that varies the amount of data that you fork. But this is one example over here. It does a lot of copying. And some of them are more initialization intensive, as you can see. Some of them are, have a balance. But significant amount of traffic is spent uh, for copying and zeroing. And, okay, uh, this is the performance and energy results from simulation for single core. As you can see, uh, you get significant performance improvements. And performance improvements are commensurate with the amount of copying and zeroing that you have in the workloads. For example, Forkbench does a lot of copying. As a result, its performance improves by 40%. Shell also does a lot of copying and zeroing. As a result, its performance also improves by 40%. And this is a memory energy reduction. This time it's correct, it's memory energy not the entire system energy. So you can see that there is a significant energy reduction up to 70% almost in the memory because some of these benchmarks are dominated uh, with uh, copying. So improvements, one, one key takeaway is improvements correlate with fraction of memory traffic due to copy and initialization. So what about multi-core systems? So clearly there are not, not only single core systems in the world, there are, all systems are multi-core. What if you have an application that's doing copying or initialization and another application that needs the memory bus at the same time? And this happens a lot. It could be happening right now, well, when I'm using this. It happens in the cloud, for example. Somebody else is running some application next to you. And, you're, uh, and they're hogging the memory bandwidth a lot because they're doing a lot of copying, right? So that's the scenario that this paper is simulating. Half of the cores run copy initialization and remaining half run simple spec applications. And this is the performance benefit that you get in terms of system performance. It's significant, and it increases with the number of cores you have because memory bandwidth becomes more precious if you have more cores and more applications. Uh, and as you can see, this is the memory energy savings. So energy is not as nice of a trend because energy has a lot of things to it. But still, there are significant savings. It's at least 15%. Oh, well, this is actually averaged over many workloads. Okay. So summary, I think I've given you the summary of the paper and we're going to analyze it in the remaining whatever minutes right now. Uh, basically, block data copy and initialization, you unnecessarily move data on the memory channel uh, and they degrade signals of performance and efficiency and they're important for many applications. I would have added that to the summary actually. I, I took the slide from my uh, student's uh, presentation. You can do that also as long as you attribute, uh, but I would suggest adding more. Uh, and uh, uh, row clone, essentially, the, this paper proposed the idea of row clone. It performs copy in DRAM with low cost. And the key idea is this, basically, at least in the interest of case. You basically do two consecutive activates, which bring the data consecutively from the source row to the row buffer and then row buffer to destination row. And you get significant energy savings in the best case and energy and performance uh, latency savings. And uh, this accelerates copy on write and block zeroing. Those are the two primitives that are discussed heavily in the paper. And those, are, those primitives are used by many applications at the higher level. Uh, and as you can see, it's improves performance and energy efficiency at low cost. So the cost is very little in the DRAM chip area and some in the memory controller. And for eight core systems, you get significant performance improvements, overall performance improvements, 27%. And I think this is energy efficiency, actually memory energy efficiency. Is the summary clear? Okay, so that's summary. Let's talk about strengths and weaknesses. I have less time to spend on these, uh, but you guys will have more time. Okay, 
but I will still cover a lot of them. Maybe you, you, you can come up with others. Basically, it's a simple, novel and mechanism to solve an important problem. This is actually a strength to have. <laughs> if, if, uh, that's the strength of a good paper in general. They should be solving an important problem. They should be coming up with a novel mechanism. It should be simple. Right? In this case, it's simple. Actually, it's, it's so simple that it was surprising to us that no one has did it. No, no one did it before. And no one actually did it before. Many people asked us, like, how come no one did it before? And it's true that no one did it before. There's no work in the area. I guess that's the beauty of uh, doing research, right? You come up with something that no one did it before. And if it's simple, all, it's all the better. It's effective and low hardware overhead. Uh, it's an intuitive idea. I think I like this. I put it as a separate uh, slide because it's intuitive. Once you actually see it, uh, it's intuitive. And it greatly improves performance and efficiency, so results are good, assuming data is mapped nicely. It seems like a clear win for data initialization. So even if you say, okay, maybe data copy, I'm not going to implement, but data initialization, there is very little overhead, right? Because it doesn't even have mapping requirements, especially if you're initializing a lot of data, and which happens in a lot of databases, uh, data intensive systems. It makes software designers' life easier. I added this, this is not discussed in the paper, but for example, if copies are 10x to 100x cheaper, how do you design the software? Actually, there is a huge uh, software effort that is done today to minimize the amount of copies that you have in the system because it, they're expensive for the, for the sole reason that they're expensive. If you go to VMware, for example, which does a lot of virtual machine cloning and deduplication, they basically heavily optimize their software uh, to minimize the number of copies. And this makes software extremely complex because it's not simple logic anymore. It's not just you basically copy and you're done with it. You need to have a lot of logic to get rid of the copies as much as possible. And this basically gives you a different mindset, right? Now copies are cheap. Just do it. <laughs> Don't deal with uh, all of those software changes, right? Or maybe come to a, uh, come to a, uh, if copies are really cheap, then you don't need to change anything. And paper tackles many low level and system level issues. It has this end to end uh, uh, thinking. It's a well-written and insightful paper. I'm not saying it because it's my paper, but <laughs> if you read it, I think hopefully you'll agree. Uh, okay, but let's talk about the weaknesses. I think this is the critical part, right? What are the weaknesses? From my point of view, I think one of the biggest weaknesses, it requires data to be mapped in the same subarray to deliver the largest benefits. And this is acknowledged in the paper. Clearly, this is a weakness of the mechanisms. And also, I think maybe it's a fundamental weakness of uh, this sort of data copy initialization. Simply, you just need to move data farther if the data is mapped, uh, source and destination are mapped farther away from each other. So you need to do good mapping. And it helps less if the data movement is not within a subway, and it doesn't help if data movement is across DEM channels. It's not something that's discussed in the paper. Uh, but if, you're, if you need to move data from this DEM channel to this DEM channel, this mechanism is not your mechanism because it's not designed for that purpose, right? And I think one question one might have, uh, although I'm not sure if that's a reason uh, to attack the paper, is how much of the copy copies are happening across memory channels, right? Maybe we have some other problems in the system design, right? Okay, intra subarray copy is very, well, this should be inter subarray. Okay, I'm going to fix this right now. So that's, uh, so inter subarray copy is very inefficient, right? You need to go to another bank, and then you need to go from that bank uh, to uh, the destination bank, the destination subarray, even though the source and destination are in the same bank but different subarrays. So that's very inefficient. So that's not good. Can we improve that? It causes many changes in the system stack to be uh, well done. End-to-end -end design spans applications to circuits. And I think this is a weakness because it makes it harder to adopt, right? Software hardware cooperative solution might not always be easy to adopt, but we should be looking for those solutions, of course. I'll finish this and then we'll take a break. Finish this meaning, finish this uh, summary. And then cache coherence and data reuse cause real overheads. And those are real actually, and they, they're somewhat uh, not fully analyzed in the paper. Uh, so I think these are actually uh, downsides, that are real downsides potentially. So evaluation is that, so, and then there are the evaluation downsides, which, we're, which is going to bring us to the rat hole figure. <laughs> so evaluation is done only in simulation. That's true. Evaluation doesn't consider multi-chip and many other systems actually. And are these the best workloads to evaluate? <laughs> That's actually always the case. Maybe uh, actually this, go, this can work in favor of the mechanism or against the mechanism. In this case, I believe it. There are many other workloads that do a lot of copy initialization that are not evaluated in the paper. So that can work in favor of the mechanism also. So okay, try to avoid the rat holes. <laughs> if you push too much on the, basically if only weaknesses, simulation and workloads, then that may not be uh, a great weakness because we'll be spending all of our time 
trying to rescue that rat from that rat hole. Okay, thoughts and ideas. So maybe some extension thoughts. Can this be improved to do faster inter sub -A copy? That's the first thing to attack. Of course, I know the field, and I know that one of my other students came up with an idea to fix that problem, to do that inter sub -A copy by asking exactly the same question, basically. He saw this row clone, and he said, okay, I'm gonna fix this. And he fixed that by adding uh, this, making this inter sub -A copy. There's a paper called LISA, Low Cost Interlinked sub -A's that does this, I'm gonna reference it. Can this be extended to move data at smaller granularities? Yeah, it's good to think about that. Can we have more efficient solutions to a cache coherence or data reuse after copy initialization? These are good questions, I think. I don't know, but these are good research areas also. Maybe we can brainstorm, but I would like to give you the break before we brainstorm. Can this idea be evaluated on a real system? How? I think this is really a good question. And what does it take to evaluate on a real system? It's very difficult because there's no chip that does it. So you need to actually first build the chip if you want to be able to build, evaluate on a real system. And this is an architect's dilemma, actually. If you want to prove your idea as an arch this architectural idea, do you actually build your chip and wait for five years? It may take five years, actually, and show your idea, or do you actually show it in simulation and hope that, and also uh, provide enough evidence and hope that people pick it up? So there are two styles. It's very difficult to do the chip building part, especially in memory space. Because we know actually how to do a lot of uh, manufacturing and logic uh, design in academia, but memory space is very, very limited. Uh, SRAM is okay, DRAM is very hard. And flash and phase change memory, all of those memory space, forget it. It's very difficult to build real things. And even if you build it, you may not still be able to convince people because your technology may not be as good as what Samsung has, right? <laughs> so there are, there are always these questions. It's good to consider these. But this is, this is what I call the architect's dilemma. Do you build it? Do you prototype it? Do you simulate it? And there are benefits to all of them, but you've got to make the right choice. In this case, if you wanted to build the system, it would have been too late, probably. <laughs> but now that this paper is published, actually a lot of people, and we've talked to people, they're actually looking into how to implement that in their real system, like Samsung chips, Hynix chips. They're actually, they have more expertise. It's better to work with them to actually enable these ideas. Okay, can similar ideas and DM properties be used to perform computation on data? Let's take it to the next step, right? This, this could be actually another extension that you could propose. Maybe you don't have an idea, but you could propose it. And that's exactly what Vivek did in the rest of his thesis. He basically proposed what he called AMBIT. It's basically a memory accelerator that does in DRAM bitwise and or not operations. So it's a bulk bitwise engine in DRAM. But it's really built on row clone in the end, because row clone, you have to have this mechanism for copying data to be able to do any operation in DRAM. If you cannot copy data, whenever you do an operation, you destroy the data. Okay, so these are the papers that built on it. So you could actually read those papers uh, if, you're, uh, if you ha have this paper assigned, but you don't have that luxury anymore. This paper is gone. Although I'm not sure if this was ever on the list. Uh, so this is the LISA paper. It enables fast inter sub data movement. It's a direct uh, paper that directly builds on it. This is the fast bulk bitwise and an OR in DRAM. And this, this generalizes it to such that you have not also and had much better evaluations as well. Okay, so takeaways. Uh, actually, this is very similar takeaways to the last paper that I reviewed. <laughs> I just slightly changed something, some things. <laughs> Don't necessarily do that. I think it doesn't work for all papers, but I think I found that it works nicely. It's an OWL method to accelerate data copy and utilization, simple and effective, hardware software cooperative, it happens to be. And I think good potential for work building on it to extend it to different granularities, to make things more efficient and effective like cache coherence. And multiple works have already uh, built on the paper, Lisa, Ambit, and there are many, many others uh, that you can find. And I like this part also. It's hopefully you'll be assigned easy to understand, uh, read and understand papers. And then the rest is open discussion basically. I think I copied the same thing from the last one. Basically thoughts on the previous ideas, how practical is this? We could talk about that. Will the problem become bigger and more important? Will the solution become more important? And I think this problem will become bigger and more important actually. Uh, solution, simple solutions are more important certainly. Are other solutions better? I'm not sure if they exist as good as this. But of course they may be better in some way. They may have less complexity in the system level, right? Uh, but this has very little complexity in the chip level. And is it clearly advantageous in some cases? I think it's clearly advantageous in the case where you're initializing data. Uh, okay, and that's the paper that we covered. Okay, I think we should take a break over here. Uh, 
So let's, be, uh, let's take a 15 minute break until 20, 420, and then we'll continue. Okay, let's get started. So any, any thoughts on this paper? Maybe we can have some discussion before you move to the next one. Has it, had anybody seen this paper before? No? So this is your first time. So any other ideas, thoughts, comments? Yes? Could something like uh, row buffer be implemented like in between the banks and then connect it to the subarrays and then mm -hmm. you could also like do something like analog mm -hmm. copying and use that the same idea between banks right yeah. yeah i think it's 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 possible to do potentially but the distances make it harder because now you still need to go through that interconnect and you need to amplify things but it's certainly possible to do i think the cost may be higher Certainly if you do that. Yeah, the advantage of this is it's already taking advantage of row buffers that exist. Uh, if you do that, you will be changing the structure of the DRAM or adding additional row buffers. We but I like the thinking. We could potentially have uh, like huge savings if it's the same like in the user. Uh, yeah, potentially. Mm -hmm. Potentially, that's true. Although the cost may not be as... <laughs> Nice. Yes? Uh, out of interest, it's been five years now. Have you already seen any reaction from <laughs> the industry? Maybe on no. the first implementations? In yeah, the well, I think some, this is the downside with memory industry sometimes. They don't talk much. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, they're, uh, certainly the memory industry, both the memory industry and the software industry is very, very interested in solutions like this. Now, internally, they may be implementing it and they may be testing it that I may not be able to talk about. But, uh, so externally, there is need. Uh, so one of the issues in memory is ex if you want to expose it externally, uh, usually there is a standard agreed upon interface. And changing that interface, the DDR interface, these discussions happen through the JEDEC. Uh, that's the standard. That's what, it's called JEDEC, J-E-D-E-C. I don't remember what it stands for, some electronic device, blah, blah. <laughs> but basically, uh, though many companies belong to that, that association, and they need to agree upon changes and that makes even the simplest changes take a long time to really get implemented <laughs> so right now it's kind of at that state if you will but uh, internally everyone agrees that this is a good thing to do <laughs> that's a good question what else So some of the papers that will be presented over here are trying to break that interface, for example, get rid of that rigid interface, which is really a, a limiter of progress in computing today, that rigid interface between processor and memory. And I think this is one paper that, one relatively early paper that proposes that with a very simple mechanism. So a lot of the time the proposals are very complex, but this is a very, very simple thing. That's why DRM manufacturers are on board with it, but the interface changes. <laughs> yes? Do you need a dedicated zero row, or could you just maybe add a mechanism to zero out the row? Box? Yeah, that's a, great, that's a great idea, I think. If you can do that, that's much better, right? Yeah, so you zero out the row buffer and then copy it, right? I like that idea. Yes. I mean, there's a general rule that you can solve any problem in computer science by adding another layer of expression. And this seems like some mini uh, EMA added on to a single uh, RAM chip. Would it also be feasible to actually just add a DMA or a smaller DMA on uh, an entire RAM uh, DIM mm -hmm. uh, and do the things there? Mm -hmm. Because that would need some memory bandwidth actually, mm -hmm. also to, to just uh, transmit the commands. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, it would probably solve the other issues that uh, you would have a bandwidth issue on the DIM itself, but not mm -hmm. uh, between DIMs and uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly you can add something into the DIM, that, uh, but you're not proposing it for this purpose, right? Copying data. It could do some other things, maybe. Right? Yeah, it could also copy, right? It could also copy. So the downside, uh, the downside of copying on the DIM level is your benefits reduce, right? Yeah. Because now you're going off the DRAM chip into some other 
chip on the DIMM. Yeah. And as you can see, the benefits are already low uh, if you're doing it within the DRAM chip, but far away. Uh, yeah, but yeah, certainly. I think certainly that's another, uh, and that's an easier thing to potentially do because you could actually manufacture a DIMM. Anyone can do it. Low cost is another issue, but you could do that much more easily, certainly. My feeling is if you have a DIMM, maybe copying is not the best, but maybe you do some pre-processing of the data, for example, on the DIMM before you send it out. Or maybe you do a lot of pre-processing over there and filtering. But yeah, I think the benefit is really, yeah, it's a lot easier to change. Anything else? Yes? What about software, like more software solutions, for example, for copying? Instead of really copying, doing like a copy and write, mm -hmm. because I have the feeling that often mm -hmm. you, it's like an unnecessary copy that doesn't uh, get modified, mm -hmm. or also with serial, like having the, I don't know, like the memory chip mm -hmm. remember these rows are zeroed, mm -hmm. even though they aren't zeroed. So when uh, yes. it's <laughs> just a read, uh, the memory chip, chip would directly answer, yes. Yeah, these are zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think you're, you're talking about different solutions, right? The software, the first software solution, copy on write. I think software is heavily optimized to do copy on write, the good software. So people are trying to do, especially when they care about performance, they want to get rid of copies as much as possible. So copy on write is the standard solution uh, that's employed in existing software. And people do even more <laughs> on top of that. So this accelerates copy on write, of course. Uh, but copy on write, even copy on write has issues. Maybe you don't copy the entire thing, right? You copy, maybe you write to only a byte, but now you copy the entire thing. So how do you optimize that? That, become, that makes the software even more complex. Actually, Vivek went on to do some other work after this. Uh, he called it page overlays. It's again a hardware software cooperative solution. But whenever you do copy on write, for example, you don't copy the entire thing, but you copy the delta. So you could create a some, somewhat of a page and it's just the delta that you store, and then you reconstruct the entire page if needed. So you can optimize things that way. And the other thing, I think memory, uh, what was the other solution that you had? Uh, say, like remembering in the memory, yeah. Mm -hmm. zeroed out. Yeah, basically keeping a list of uh, zero dot places. Yeah, I think that's, that's certainly possible. Or you could do it in the virtual memory system, right? Yeah. If, uh, yeah. At some point, you'll have to zero out things. Uh, you if, you, if you have to, that's right. If you need to write some value somewhere, maybe you need to zero out the round values or for coherency reasons, you may need to do that at some point. But yes, I think those solutions are, are actually proposed. Uh, yeah. Yes. I have a question that's a bit more general about the memory bandwidth limitation mm -hmm. topic. Uh, most papers I've seen just are dealing with the problem by entirely circumventing the whole uh, bottleneck by just doing things in memory, like in in memory computations, I've seen and stuff like that. Is there any research into just getting rid of the bottleneck altogether? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Well, that depends on what you mean by getting rid of the bottleneck. That could be reducing the bandwidth, which is very difficult because many applications have this memory intensity, or is it fundamentally designing the system such that you don't have this bandwidth bottleneck? So I think uh, in-memory computation works get closer to that, right? Basically, there is no uh, single interconnect. Now you have, you have potentially many processing units. They're all interconnected to memory directly somehow. I think that gets rid of, that's why in-memory computation is, uh, I don't think it's circumventing the bottleneck, but it's, it's really getting past the bottleneck. So I think those are the closest works. Other than, of course, in software, you get rid of memory accesses. I think if you can get rid of stuff in software, that's always good. So if you can get rid of copies, that's a good idea. Anything else? These are good questions. Or should we move on to another example? What do you think? Last chance for questions. No questions. OK, I'll move on to another example then. I'll do this in a different way. I'm not going to review the paper. But I'm going to give you an example of uh, a conference presentation, 
a paper that I've written. I've given the presentation, but I haven't looked at this recently, so let's see how this goes. <laughs> Although I like this paper. Uh, so this was the work that we did uh, at Microsoft Research uh, uh, within uh, ETH alumnus, actually. Thomas uh, is from Switzerland, and he was my, not office mate, but we were in uh, adjacent offices, and Thomas did his PhD, uh, actually all his degrees here at ETH, uh, and we worked together to write this paper. So I'll give you a conference talk, basically. <laughs> of course, maybe I'll interject in between and say, make jokes or something, but and you can ask questions and analyze what I described as opposed to me analyzing the paper itself, right? And I'm going to use exactly the same slides that I used about 10 years ago. This was in 2008 uh, in ISCA in China, in Beijing. Uh, okay, so I'll talk about parallelism of back scheduling, enhancing both performance and fairness of shared DRAM systems. This is the outline, it's called give background and goal first, and then we'll take it from there. So DRAM system looks like this at some abstraction level. Basically, you have banks that consist of two-dimensional arrays of columns and rows, and data can be accessed only from the row buffer. And each bank has a row buffer, and you get bank-level parallelism uh, by uh, overlapping accesses to different banks. And a DRAM controller orchestrates that bank-level parallelism. Because of this structure of the DRAM, a DRAM controller uses a policy prioritization order that's called first ready, first come, first serve. A row buffer, an access to a row that's already in the row buffer takes much shorter than an access to a row that's not in the row buffer. As a result, it prioritizes the accesses that go into the, uh, that hit in the row buffer. Otherwise, it prioritizes the accesses that are older than others. So this is the policy that's employed today. The goal is to maximize DRAM throughput because the access to the row buffer is much faster than an access to some row that's not in the row buffer. And oldest first, the idea is to have some, some sort of fairness. Okay, in multi-core systems, uh, so this is the design of the DRAM controller that carries through from single core systems. In multi-core systems, we have the same DRAM structure over here, a memory controller, but the core structure is changing. We have many more cores now and some sort of cache structure. But the key over here is that you have a shared memory system that consists of DRAM. And when these cores access DRAM, their requests interfere in the memory controller. Memory controller has a choice to prioritize one over the other. So it turns out this is an important problem. Basically, threads delay each other uh, by causing resource contention. Sorry, I had to switch to something. Yeah, by causing resource contention. And this contention happens in the bus, in the bank, in the row buffer. And we've shown that in some of our previous papers that was published and presented at Micro, Stall Time Fair Memory Scheduling. In this work, we also show that threads can also destroy each other's bank-level parallelism. When uh, otherwise, parallel requests can become serialized because if a thread is running alone, its requests are serviced in parallel, but when some other threads requests come in, both of those threads requests may be serialized. And existing DRAM schedulers are unaware of this interference. They simply aim to maximize DRAM throughput as I described. They use the FRFCFS policy that tries to maximize DRAM throughput. They are thread unaware and as a result they are thread unfair because they have no intent to service each thread's requests in parallel today. So a 5 CFS policy, as I said, it's row hit first and then oldest first. It unfairly prioritizes threads that have high, high row buffer locality. And it also unfairly prioritizes threads that are older, that, uh, whose requests appear older, memory intensive threads. So this is one example of the consequences of uncontrolled inter-thread interference in DRAM. These are results from simulation. These are four different workloads. Uh, we simulated uh, them running together and running alone, and we compared the performance they get, the slowdown that they experience, compared to when they run alone on the same system. One, and DRAM is the only shared resource over here. One application, very streaming, slows down by only 5%, another application slows down by about 8x. And some of these applications may, may have uh, real-time requirements. For example, if you're doing video decoding and you, you don't want frames to be skipping, right? So there are many issues related to this uncontrolled inter-thread interference in the DRAM system. You get unfair slowdown of different threads. People may be discomfortable. You get system performance loss because this core may be making progress, but it's very heavily memory intensive. So it's not making a lot of progress, even though it is getting its request serviced. But this core, it's not that memory intensive. It's just waiting for memory requests to be serviced for a long time. So exactly, you would like to enable many cores to make progress, but this is doing exactly the opposite. As a result, system performance is not 
is, is reducing. And you get vulnerability of denial of service, as we've discussed in using security last year. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that. Somebody will present that paper here uh, later. And you have the inability to enforce system level threat priorities because if you change the threat priority over here, oh, I already said this, I didn't animate, but if you change the priority over here, this memory performance hog doesn't change, basically. All, you have four cores and all threads are scheduled. An operating system basically says, good luck, run together. Uh, it's not going to deschedule some of the applications. Okay, so there are a lot of issues, basically. As a result, uh, you have an uncontrollable system. So our goal in this work is to control inter-thread interference in DM and design a shared, shared across multi -course, multiple cores, shared DM scheduler that provides three characteristics. It provides high system performance by preserving each thread's DUM bank level parallelism. It provides fairness to threads sharing the DUM system by trying to equalize memory slowdowns of equal priority threads. I'll talk about that. It's controllable and configurable. It enables different service levels for threads with different priorities because you don't want uh, perfect fairness all the time. Sometimes you care about one thread more than others, right? So let's take a look at this DM bank level parallelism. That's one of the key contributions of the paper. And our motivation was that actually. So what we observed is that when you're running multiple applications together, you can destroy the intra-thread bank level parallelism. So why is this important? Processors are designed to tolerate the latency of memory requests by generating multiple outstanding misses. This is the notion of memory level parallelism. You can generate multiple requests, and there are multiple ways of doing it. You could use out-of-order execution, non-blocking caches, run-ahead execution. You can have multiple requests in flight. And this has been a very useful thing uh, to improve performance. Out-of-order processors have been uh, have been high performance because you can service these requests in parallel. Now, this is effective only if the DRAM controller actually services the multiple requests in parallel in DRAM banks, assuming in the first place that these requests go to the DRAM banks in parallel. So in multi-core systems, multiple threads share the DRAM controllers, and the DRAM controllers are not aware of a thread's memory level parallelism. As a result, we found out that it can service each thread's outstanding requests serially and not in parallel. And this leads to a performance loss in the thread, as well as the entire system. So let's take a look at it pictorially. I'm going to show you what happens when you have a single thread executing and with a memory that has two banks. So the thread computes, then it gets two DRAM requests. It sends their request to the memory controller. Their requests happen to map to different banks, which is good. And the memory controller starts servicing this request first. The thread stalls, and the memory controller starts servicing this next request next in the next cycle. These two requests are going, uh, being serviced in parallel, and do, uh, while they're being serviced in parallel, the thread stalls. After some point, this is done. It gets sent back to the core. The core still stalls because it needs the other request also. And then this request is done. The data is sent back to the core, and now the core can compute. So what happened here is the thread had two requests. They went to two different banks, but the bank accesslatencies of the two requests are overlapped. As a result, the thread stalls approximately for one bank access latency. There are other access latencies that I'm not showing here, but the bank access latency is a dominant part of the DRAM access latency. So this is beautiful because you paralyzed the requests and you stalled only once per two requests as opposed to stalling once per each request. Now let's see what happens if you, have, uh, uh, if you run these two threads on an existing system with uh, a row hit first scheduler like we discussed or a scheduler that's unaware of interference. Let's assume you have the same thread copied, but it's doing something different. They both generate two DRAM requests, and these requests happen to arrive at the memory controller like this, in this order. And let's assume the memory controller services the request in the arrival order. It takes first thread A's request to bank zero, schedules it. Both threads stall. It takes then thread B's request to bank one and schedules it. Both these requests get serviced in parallel, and during that time, both threads stall. Then this request is done, the data gets back uh, to the core. Uh, the memory controller takes the next request, schedules it to bank zero. Then this request gets done, the data gets sent back to the core, and the memory controller schedules this uh, last request to this bank. Even though first data items have arrived, these threads keep stalling because they need two requests to be serviced as opposed to one request to, be, to progress, right? So both of these threads stall until these last requests get serviced. And after that, the threads can compute. So what happened here is each thread had two requests to different banks, but their requests got serialized because the memory controller actually was not aware that these threads had uh, memory level parallels. 
The bank access latency of each thread was serialized. Each thread stole for approximately two bank access latencies, as opposed to one in the previous example that I showed you. So the key question we ask is, can we do better? In this case, can, if you had an intelligent memory scheduler, it would recognize that these requests can be serviced in parallel and would do something better. And something better is this, basically. The same scenario, requests come in the same order as here into the memory controller. And the memory controller is parallelism aware. What it does is it takes thread A's request to bank zero, schedules it. Now in the next thing, it doesn't take the next request, but it, said, it asks the question, is there another request from thread A to some other bank? And it finds it, the last, thread, uh, the last request, and schedules it. Now, both threads stall while these two requests are being serviced. Now the first request is done. The memory controller takes the thread B's request to bank zero, schedules it. And then the next request is done. The memory controller, of course, sends the data back and thread takes thread B's request and schedules it. Now what happened here was, because we first serviced thread A's request in parallel, thread A can continue computation at this point when both of its data requests come back from memory. Thread B continues to stall until the last two requests are done. So if you look over here, compared to the baseline scheduler, we saved cycles in this particular thread because we were aware of the parallelism of the requests. So if you look at this picture, both threads have their requests to different banks serviced in parallel. No problem, we didn't break the parallelism. We didn't serialize any of the requests. We just ensured that this thread's requests were serviced first and this thread's requests were serviced next. As a result, you save overall cycles. And if you look at the average stall time, here you get about one and a half bank access latencies. Okay, so that's the key idea of par parallelism over back scheduling. Now let's see how we can actually implement it. So there are two principles behind this. And I, the first principle I just gave you, it's called parallelism awareness. Uh, this idea can be summarized as uh, you schedule requests from a thread to different banks back to back. This preserves each thread bank parallelism. But this can cause starvation. And as a result, the second principle we employ is batching because it can cause starvation because you may actually service this thread's request and the thread keeps generating requests. As a result, you would be prioritizing that thread only. To, to ensure you uh, eliminate starvation, we have the second principle, request batching. The idea is to group a fixed number of oldest requests from each thread into a batch and service that batch before all other requests. That way you ensure that nobody is starved and there's some sort of fairness in the system and you form a new batch when the current one is done. This eliminates starvation and provides fairness, and this allows parallelism awareness within a batch. So within a batch, you can do parallelism awareness without consideration for starvation. So let's take a look at it, look at both of these principles. So basically threads generate requests, in this case four threads, each has two requests to two different banks. We form a batch, at some point we declare the batch, we're gonna talk about that. Um, and within the batch, we basically follow the parallelism awareness principle. We take thread zero's requests first, schedule them, so parallelism is preserved. Thread two keeps generating requests, as you can see, we don't include them in the batch, because if we include them in the batch, we may be starving others. And then thread one's requests are served, and then thread two's requests are served, and then thread three's requests are served, and you get good parallelism, and then you form a new batch after that. That's the idea, basically. It's very simple. So how do you do these two components? How do you design them? Request batching and within batch scheduling. Uh, request batching is simple. Each memory request has a bit. It's called a marked bit. Uh, and basically batch formation happens uh, when the previous batch is done. There are no marked requests in the system. And the memory controller goes through the request queues and marks up to some number of requests, number of oldest requests per bank for each thread. Uh, this is called marking cap. Of course, this enables a trade-off now, which we're going to discuss later. Mark requests constitute the batch, and mark requests are prioritized over unmarked ones. That ensures uh, that there is no reordering of requests across the batches, no starvation, high fairness. Uh, high fairness, we'll get back to that. How do you prioritize requests within a batch? That's the next question, now that we've formed the batch. Uh, so within, there are many other ways of forming the batch, but uh, we're, we're limiting ourselves to this one uh, for now. So within batch scheduling, you can actually use any existing DM policy. Uh, the AMP scheduling policy. It could use FRFCFS, as we've discussed earlier. This exploits the robot for locality. But we also want to preserve intra-thread bank parallelism, service each thread's request back to back. So the idea uh, that we propose is to have the scheduler compute a ranking of threads when the batch is formed. And remember, we want to, uh, uh, to, to maximize parallelism, we want parallelism awareness. 
and we want to prioritize, we want to request, send the request of a thread back to back. So you form a ranking and you follow that ranking to schedule the request. Higher ranked threads are prioritized over row rank ones, and this improves the likelihood that requests from a thread are serviced in parallel by different banks, because different threads are prioritized in the same order across all of the banks. Okay, so now the next question is, of course, okay, ranking is good, it preserves parallelism awareness maybe, but how do you form this ranking? It affects both throughput and fairness, that's why this is important, and our goal is twofold. We want to maximize the system throughput with parallelism awareness, as well as enabling the cores to make progress, and we want to minimize unfairness, and unfairness in our case in this case, our definition is to equalize the slowdown of the threads. Uh, or else being equal, that's not a bad unfairness definition, but of course, fairness is a huge concept and there are many, many definitions of it. We're going to use this one. So if you want to max, it turns out both of these point to a similar policy. The first, if you want to maximize the system throughput, you want to minimize the average stall times of the thread within the batch. You want to minimize the red parts, basically, on average. The green parts you want to maximize. If you want to minimize unfairness, you really want to service the threads with inherently low stall time early in the batch. So if a thread stalls a little bit, you want to, uh, more than the, another thread, you would like to prioritize that thread. Because let's assume that you have a memory intensive thread and a memory non-intensive thread. Memory non-intensive thread initially has a low stall time to begin with. Memory intensive thread has a very high stall time for memory. Let's assume that both of them are impacted by equal amounts. That equal amount affects the memory non-intensive thread much worse because it has a little stall time. It gets, let's say, its stall time gets doubled. Whereas if you're memory intensive to begin with, if you just get the same amount of stall, uh, just a little bit more, more stall time, it doesn't matter because you're so delayed because of memory. So that's the insight. Delaying memory non-intensive thread is not good for fairness because they get impacted a lot. So it turns out shortest stall time first or shortest job first ranking, maximize the throughput. Actually, this is proven to be optimal in the case where you have a single bank without a row buffer. Uh, it's, done, uh, it's done in factory production, actually. Uh, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, in this case, our, we cannot claim any optimality in system throughput because we have a very different system, many banks, many row buffers. But basically, the idea is the controller estimates each thread's stall time within the batch and ranks the threads with shorter stall time higher. So let's take a look at an example of this to motivate it. Uh, basically, we actually uh, uh, have two metrics, maximum number of mark requests to any bank for a given thread, this is called max bank load, and we rank the thread with lower max bank load higher because this approximates low stall time, and as a tiebreaker, we use total number of mark requests, this is called total load. If there's a tie, we rank the thread with lower total load higher. Basically, remember, we're trying to approximate stall time. If a thread has small stall time to begin with, we're going to prioritize that. If a thread has lots of stall time to begin with, we're going to deprioritize that within that batch. You may think this is unfair. Yes, it's unfair within the batch potentially. Uh, it, it can starve. If, if you do it indefinitely, it can starve threads that have a lot of requests. But remember the batching boundary. We're doing this only within a batch. Okay, so let's take a look at this is the batch. And now we have different threads. I'm going to ignore the row buffer here, but the paper is an example with the row buffer. And these threads have different number of requests. Let's compute these two metrics for these threads. Thread zero has only one request maximum to any bank, so its max bank load is one, its total load is three. So it has three requests to, across all of the banks. Thread one, its max bank load is two because the maximum number of requests it has to any bank is two, its total load is four. Uh, thread, three, uh, thread two, its max bank load is two because the maximum number of requests it has to any bank is two, to bank one and bank two. Its total load is six. And thread three is the heaviest one. It has the highest uh, stall time to begin with. Basically, it has five uh, requests to bank three, so its max bank load is five, and its total load is nine. Now we can form a ranking based on our principles. Right? Basically, it says shortest max bank, max bank load first. It's ranked the highest. And then we have a tiebreaker here. Thread one is ranked higher than thread two because thread two is more intensive, as you can see and thread three is ranked the lowest. And we're going to use this ordering to schedule the requests. So let's take a look at the baseline scheduling order. Let's assume this is the arrival order. It's first come, first serve. If you use the scheduling order, I'm going to assign some time units. Assume that each request takes one bank access latency over here. Let's take a look at how long it takes for each thread to finish its request. Thread zero, 
basically, this is the order of requests. Uh, and thread zero's last request gets serviced after four time units. So its stall time is four. Thread one's last request gets serviced after four time units also. Its stall time is four. Thread two's last request gets serviced after five time units. Its stall time is five. Thread three's last request gets serviced after seven time units, as you can see over here. So it stalls for seven. And on average, threads stall by, uh, for five bank access latencies. Now let's look at our parallelism aware batch scheduling within for this batch. Remember the ranking, we're going to prioritize T0 over T1 over T2 over T3. So the first memory controller is going to prioritize T0's requests. Its parallelism is going to be preserved. It's going to, its last request is serviced after one bank access latency. Next, of course this is happening while things are running, so it's not next really. The memory controller is taking thread 1's request and scheduling it to bank 0. So thread 1's requests are form, uh, scheduled like this. And its last request is serviced after two bank access latencies, so it stalls for two units. Thread 2's request gets scheduled like this next. So it stalls for four uh, units. And thread 3's request gets scheduled like this, so it stalls for seven time units. So within this batch, as you can see, the average bank access latency uh, is 3.5 for each thread. Uh, for, uh, for on average across all threads. So we have a, about a 30% reduction in the average stall time of the threads. And it looks nice, as you can see, the parallelism is preserved across for each thread as much as possible, as opposed to this order where parallelism is not preserved and you get a lot of serialization, potentially. Of course, it's a nice example, right? I picked this example to motivate the mechanism. <laughs> but the, the paper actually has another example with the robuffer locality. Okay. Uh, okay, so basically, how do you actually design the policy right now? So you need a scheduling policy. We want to keep it simple. So we're going to modify the baseline FRFCFS scheduling policy in two ways. This is FRFCFS priority order one, FRFCFS priority order two. I said that already. So we're going to add batching. Mark requests are prioritized over everything else star that provides starvation freedom. FRFCFS is not starvation free to begin with. And then this is parallelism awareness. Now, the paper has a lot of detail on the ordering of these. It turns out if you want true parallelism awareness, you want uh, higher ranked threads first scheduled, like, just like I described. But parallelism and locality go against each other because there's also a robot for locality, which is important in scheduling. And it, empirically, we found out that this policy works better than the other ordering where higher ranked thread is ordered. Uh, the, basically, higher ranked thread first is the uh, higher Ordering, uh, ordering requirement compared to a row hit first request. So there are three properties of this. It exploits both row buffer locality and intra-thread bank parallelism with the rules two and three. Maybe not the best of both, so there's a, a room for improvement. It's work conserving. Basically, this means that it doesn't waste bandwidth. It services unmarked requests to banks without marked requests, so it's a prioritization order. If a bank doesn't have a marked request, you go to the next priority level. If a bank doesn't have a row hit request, you, get, you go to the next priority level. Marking cap is important. This, uh, this is the cap that decides how big is your batch. If you actually have a small cap, your batch is small, which means that the ability to exploit the robot for locality within a smaller number of requests is lower. If your cap is too large, now uh, you starve some of the threads for longer. For example, a memory non-intensive thread, it cannot re insert its request into a batch. It needs to wait until the next batch, but it needs to wait for many more requests if your batch is too large. So this is important and this is analyzed in the paper in, in detail. And there are many more trade-offs that are analyzed in the paper also. So what is the hardware cost of this? It turns out there's an analysis in the paper. It's less than 1.5 kilobyte storage cost with a relatively large system, eight core system with 128 memory request buffer. No complex operations, divisions, uh, not on the critical path. Scheduler makes a decision on only every DRAM cycle. Okay, let's talk about system software support a little bit. So how do you actually make this more flexible? How do you enable the operating system to convey the priority level of each set to the controller? Basically, there's an interface to be able to do that. Uh, you provide levels of priority, highest to lowest priority, and the controller enforces priorities in two ways. First, it marks the request from a thread with priority X only every X batch. And that, by nature, uh, ensures that a, threads, uh, a thread that has priority level that's high, level one, uh, is always marked every batch. Uh, it gets into more batches, basically. Within a batch, a higher priority threads requests are scheduled first. So that's the idea. 
It's, uh, so there's also an opportunity for purely opportunistic service. Basically, there's a very special, very low priority level L. Requests from such threads are never marked. If you don't care about them, or you need only purely opportunistic service, when the bandwidth is available, you mark them with L, and they're not part of the batch, <laughs> ever. And there's quantitative analysis in the paper for this. But I'm not going to go through that in detail. So let's talk about evaluation a little bit. What are the benefits of this? So we evaluated this with uh, an in-house simulator that we developed, uh, which actually led to the basis of a lot of the simulators in my group right now that are open source. Uh, and we looked at four H16 core systems. And you can see the parameters over here. I'm not going to talk about that in detail. The paper has the details. But these are the uh, model uh, DRAM parameters that we have. We basically have 128 entry memory request buffer, eight banks, that's the row buffer size, and 40 nanoseconds and 80 nanoseconds row hit and row conflict latencies. And we use multi-programmed workloads. And we use a large number of combinations for different workloads. So we compare to different memory controllers. This is baseline FRFCFS. As we've discussed, this unfairly penalized threads with low row buffer locality, memory non-intensive threads. If you do first come, first serve, uh, it unfairly, it's the oldest first, basically. It gets low DRAM throughput to begin with, and it unfairly penalizes memory non-intensive threads because those threads appear to first come to the memory controller if you have a lot of requests. Uh, there's two other related works. Uh, this is network fair queuing schedule, which basically applies uh, network fair queuing principles to memory, which doesn't really fit very well because it doesn't take into account the row buffer or the banks. As a result, it equally partitions DRAM bandwidth and doesn't consider inherent base DRAM performance of each thread. So it unfairly penalized threads with high bandwidth utilization and prioritized threads with bursty access patterns, as we showed uh, in our micro paper. And this is our own prior work. Basically, the idea over there was to estimate and balance the thread slowdowns relatively when they're run alone. Uh, this is good for fairness, but it turns out this unfairly tra threats, uh, treats threads if, you, if your slowdown estimates are inaccurate. And that's actually very difficult to get right. That's those slowdown estimates. We found out that they're not easy to get right. And it also requires complex operations. Like it requires a division, but you could approximate it, but it still adds complexity. So we're going to compare it to all of these works. And this is the major result, basically, in terms of unfairness. This is unfairness as we define it. This is the maximum memory slowdown experienced by any thread in the system divided by the minimum memory slowdown experienced by any thread in the system. Ideally, you would like this to be 1 in a multi-program workload, meaning that whenever you go from uh, running this workload alone on the machine and running it together with other workloads, you don't see any slowdown. That's ideal, of course, right? And we like to get close to ideal. We cannot get perfectly close to the ideal because we have memory bandwidth limitations. And this is uh, what we get. This lower is better, clearly. So FRFCFS, first ready, first come, first serve, has very high unfairness, as previous work also showed. First come, first serve is actually better. Uh, it has lower unfairness. Uh, network fair queuing is good in for the four core case, but it becomes worse than first come, first serve. Uh, as things scale, stall time fair memory scheduling is the best previous scheduler, as you can see. But PARBS actually has better fairness than the best previous scheduler. Uh, it's about 8 to 11 uh, percent, well, 1.11 to 1.08x 1 uh, uh, on average across many workloads. OK, fairness improves because we have actually this batching. Batching, we found that it's actually good for fairness. And also, uh, we have this ranking mechanism that improves fairness. So system performance also improves. This is one metric, harmonic mean speed up. Basically, compared to the best previous scheduler, this is the per system performance improvement we get. It's about 8% to 5%. Of course, this is very much workload dependent. And the workloads are very different when you look at it, 16 core systems and four core systems. And also, this is a more bandwidth limited scenario. So if you actually add more channels, we see uh, more benefits over here. OK, uh, so that's it, basically. That's the idea. So let me summarize. Uh, basically, we've shown that inter-thread interference can destroy each thread's DM bank level parallelism because it's, uh, the memory controller serializes a thread's requests because of this interference. And that reduces system throughput. It also makes techniques that exploit memory level parallelism uh, less effective, like out of order execution and run rate execution. Existing DRAM controllers are unaware of this inter thread bank level parallelism. So we provided a new approach to a fair and high performance DRAM scheduling that takes this into account and introduces some other ideas. The two key principles are batching, batching of memory requests from different threads, eliminates starvation, and allows fair sharing of the DRAM system. And the second principle is parallelism-aware thread ranking, 
This preserves each thread's bank level parallelism within the batch. And combined together, uh, we have a, a high performance and fair scheduler. It's also flexible and configurable because it supports system level thread priorities. This way, the operating system can enforce quality of service policies. And Power BS, we've shown that provides better fairness and system performance than previous DRAM schedulers. And now that we have the bell, that's the end of my talk. Thank you. Any questions? That's a conference talk, basically. <laughs> And there, you, you normally put backup slides at the end, so if people ask, actually some person asked that question, and I use the backup slides uh, at that time to s discuss basically what happens if you do local versus global. So the question was, what happens if you have multiple memory controllers, right? Do you do a local ranking in each controller or do you do a global ranking? And we explored those over here. And this is the example from the paper, and that's the end of backup slides. So it's now your turn to analyze. <laughs> Basically, I've given you this part as a conference talk, but of course, the rest is depend on the audience. But I'm not going to give that to you. You can, you can look at it uh, in the slides. Okay, so we're done for today. We'll meet next week. And then look for the assignments that you have for papers. And if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Okay, thank you.